So with this lesson plan, you can tell your students that you're going to talk about the birds and bees of AI. Where do answers come from? Or in other words, how does AI work? So this lesson is going to give your students an overview of how generative AI works and why and how it's different than services like Google. All right, so you tell your students, say we're going to talk about AI. And the first thing I want to know from you, like, what do you think? Is AI good or bad for education? So I want you to take a minute or two, and I want you to just think on your own. Like, what are the positives and what are the negatives of AI in terms of your own education? So you give them some time to think about that. Then you say, okay, I want you to pair up, and I want you to talk with a partner. Talk with someone near you with the pros and cons you came up with. Give them another couple minutes to talk here. Then you say, okay, let's, let's discuss this amongst all of us. Then you facilitate a discussion. So you still notice we're doing the think pair share model here. Uh, the reason why it's going to create a lot more safety and a lot more dynamic, engaging conversation. If you just ask, hey, in general, is AI good or bad? You're going to have the same students responding that you always have responded to your prompts. So use the think pair share method to get more students involved in, in the conversation. And we generally, genuinely want everyone to be thinking about the positives and the negatives of AI. Okay, so then you say, you know what, it's, it's normal for, for people to feel anxious about innovations like AI. In fact, I'm going to give you three different quotes from very prominent people who are largely skeptical of these sort of innovations. So, it's dangerous and will never be practical. It's a novelty and a fad has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered. So these are all quotes from people who, it turns out all of these quotes can apply to AI, but they're not actually about AI. These are quotes from innovations that we now all take for granted. Like I said, it's common to have these sort of concerns whenever we are approached or meet something new and innovative. So for example, that very first quote about being dangerous and impractical, uh, that's actually a quote uh, that the full context is, if God had intended us to fly, he would have given us wings. It's dangerous. It will never be practical. And that quote is actually from Orville and Wilbur Wright's father. So the first people to have manned, powered flight, their father said that this is dangerous and will never be practical. That quote about it being a novelty and bad, that's actually full context is, I predict that the horse will be with us for centuries. The automobile is a novelty and a fad. And that comes from United States President William McKinley. And then finally, <clears throat> the telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. This is, of course, from William Orton, the president of Western Union, the most powerful telegram company in the United States. So <clears throat> what I want you to know, you tell your students, what I want you to know is that at the end of the day, there are positives and negatives to every innovation, but I don't want you to be stuck on the wrong side of history for this and other innovations you run into. So I want to explore the positives and negatives of AI, and I want you to really understand how they work so you can understand for yourselves like why these are beneficial or why these are dangerous. Okay, so to do that, I want you to learn something new the same way AI learns, so you can see how it collects and presents information. <clears throat> so I'm going to teach you a brand new language. This language doesn't exist, and so you're going to learn it from scratch the same way that generative AI models learn things. So I'm going to present you a number of words from this new language. Then you tell your students, what I need you to do as my generative AI is I need you to look at this list of words, and I need you to tell me which of these words refer to birds, which words refer to cats, and which words refer to neither. So if I ask you, okay, which of these are bird words, as a generative AI, you would have no clue because you haven't done the first step of AI building, which is the training. First, someone has to give you what we call labeled data. I have to tell you a few of the answers, and then you can start to find patterns and then discover your own, uh, your own subsequent uh, words that match that pattern. 
So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you some training data. I'm gonna show you a couple bird words. And when I do, I want you to notice what happens in your own mind. Like, what do you observe yourself doing? All right, so the first bird word is briz. Okay, I'm gonna show you the second bird word again. Pay attention, what happens in your brain when you see this second bird word? That word is butyl. All right, so you may have a sense now of what bird words look like, but I'm gonna show you a third one. Third bird word is vast. Okay, so we have one bird word left. And I wanna know, does anyone have any ideas for what that could be? So you ask everyone, yeah, you can take some guesses from people. For the most part, they'll come up with it. It's buell. So buell is the fourth bird word. So that was a, uh, an example of labeled training data. I told you some of these words are bird words, and then you were able, by and large, to find the fourth bird word on your own. That's because you've been doing something called pattern recognition and you discovered the pattern. The bird words in this language start with the letter B. Okay, so let's do the same thing. This time we're gonna switch over to cat words. So I'll show you a couple of the cat words, and then you tell me when you have a sense of what the next cat word is. So our first cat word, schlagat. All right, our second cat word, facade. All right, so now you can ask, okay, any ideas? We've got one cat word left. Any ideas what the last cat word is? And so you can poll the class and see, you know, who thinks, what everyone thinks. Um, most students will think it's Lorette. So you say, okay, great. So most of us think it's Lorette. It turns out, though, in this language, Lorette doesn't refer to a cat. It refers to a cow. But this is normal. This happens all the time with AI. And with training, during the training process, it makes mistakes, and this is how it learns. But it turns out that these sort of mistakes are really important to know about, that the quality of your AI output has everything to do with the quality of the data that you put into it. For example, there was a study done where doctors were trying to use AI to determine whether or not moles were malignant. So they took a bunch of pictures of moles, they fed it through an AI system, they trained it on, you know, told the AI, okay, these ones are malignant, these ones are not. <clears throat> and then it, they let it go with a large sample set of unlabeled data. And what the AI discovered was pretty profound and pretty amazing. It discovered that rulers cause cancer. Or rather, what it discovered was that if a picture had a ruler in it, it was far more likely to be a malignant mole than to be benign. And that's because the data it was trained on was skewed. The data, the pictures that, uh, that the AI was given of malignant moles largely had rulers in them because they were taken in a doctor's office where the ruler was used to give a scale of the size of the mole. And the benign moles, they were taken outside of a doctor's office or without a ruler, just because they were, you know, just random moles. And so the, the AI found a pattern, but it's not the kind of pattern that we would find particularly valuable. It found a pattern that, hey, if there's a ruler, it's more likely to be malignant. So this is really important to think about, that whenever you're using a generative AI, that you understand where the data has come from. Because if the data is skewed, if the input is skewed, the output will be skewed. So we want to think about the data particularly in terms of like political bias, gender bias, race bias, any sort of biases that go into our input of our AI training will likely be, come, likely be shown in the output as well. Okay, so we wanna be careful of our training and just know that the quality of our input will determine the quality of our output. We also know that the rat is not our last cat word. So let's take our last guess for what the right uh, final cat word is, you ask your students again, most of them will say rat, and that's correct. So rat is the final cat word. So the pattern here is that cat words have to have double letters and end with the at sound. So we now have two different patterns for this new language. We know that cat words must contain a double letter and end with an at sound. 
and we know that bird words start with a B. So now you have all the information you need to be a generative AI for this new language. In particular, if I want you to do one specific task for me, if I want you to be my AI and come up with a word that means flying cat, you tell your students, I'm gonna give you 30 seconds to see if you can combine the patterns that we know about this new language to generate a brand new word that doesn't exist <clears throat> for a flying cat. So see if you can take those two patterns and come up with a definition of a flying cat. You give them 30 seconds, give them a minute, whatever you need, and you ask people to share, okay, what did you come up with for a flying cat? And what you're looking for is any example of a word that starts with a B, contains two letters in it, and then ends with an at sound. So you can ask them, okay, how did you spell it? <clears throat> Make sure that you know, they got all the right words, all the right characters. And you say, great, that's it. You understand how generative AI works. It collects, uh, it understands, it learns a number of patterns and then combines those patterns to generate new and novel information. And that's distinct from something like Google. So when we think about where AI generates its answers from, it's tempting to think of it as like, oh, it's the next generation of Google, but it is fundamentally different. This is not a search engine. Services like Google or search engines they are a collection of data. They've surfed the web to go aggregate a bunch of discrete pieces of information. So grabbed a bunch of pieces of information and stored it in a database that says, okay, this piece of information is here, this piece of information is here. And so when someone searches for something, it just says, okay, well, uh, here's everything I know about that type of information and here's where to go find it. So it's like a giant dictionary. It just you, you look up a word, it tells you what that word means. That's what Google can do. You want to know about something, it says, oh, here's all the information I found about that topic. That's very different from our generative AI. Generative AI is not a collection of data. It's a collection of patterns. There isn't so much as like a big database full of information, so much as there is what we call a neural network of understanding of patterns. And these patterns, each of these individual patterns, you can think of it kind of like a Lego block, where if you understand a set, um, a set of patterns, you can combine them to create new and novel information. So just like we took a, uh, the, combination of the idea of a bird, the idea of a cat, and we combined them into something new to make a flying bird, or excuse me, a flying cat, I can ask, a generative AI to generate an image for me of something that's it's never seen before. As far as I know, no one has ever made a flying cat out of Legos, but I can ask a generative AI image model to generate one for me because it knows, okay, things that fly typically have wings, so I should make something that has wings. I know what a cat looks like. It, you know, it's got four legs, it's got a cute face, it's got a tail, uh, so I'll put some wings on, on something that looks like a cat. And then I know that things that are made out of Lego are blocky and have these little bumps on top. And boom, it combines those patterns into create something new and novel that has never existed. And so that's the difference. Google is pulling out is references to things it's already seen before. Generative AI is coming up with something brand new that may exist. You know, who knows? Maybe this is exactly the same image as someone else has done, but that would just be a fluke. That would just be random chance. It wouldn't be that, that the AI is necessarily pulling that information out. It's just combining the patterns it knows in the best, most effective way possible. Okay, so let's talk about the benefits and challenges of this type of technology. So you can ask your students, okay, so do we think AI is going to take your jobs? So is your degree worth nothing because AI is going to come in and do all your work for you. Um, no, AI is not going to take all of our jobs, but it will change them. It will fundamentally change them. Same way that calculators fundamentally change the way we do math and the internet fundamentally change the way we do everything, AI will change the way we work. We don't know exactly how yet, but it's already changing the way we work and it's very likely to continue to do so. Okay, but in the short term, can AI help you complete your assignments? The answer here is kind of. So it can absolutely be helpful if you need to write something, if you're brainstorming ideas, if you want to learn a new topic that you don't well know well, AI can help do all of those things. But there's a caveat, there's a condition. And that is, 
you have to know whether or not AI will lie to you. And if you don't already know, the answer is resounding yes, AI will lie to you. It won't know that it's lying to you, but it will very confidently combine the patterns it knows to present something that looks very believable, uh, but that can be very wrong. And that's what we call a hallucination. So you can ask your students, have any of you experienced a hallucination before using AI? You can get a couple examples from students and then, and then you can say, well, it turns out actually all of you have experience with AI hallucinations. And that's because those quotes I showed you, I asked ChatGBT for those quotes. And it turns out they're all lies, completely fabricated. Now, I believed they were real quotes. I thought they were real, genuine quotes until I did some fact checking on them. And it turns out that no, that ChatGPT had just combined the patterns it knows particularly well. It knows what a compelling quote looks like for someone who is fearful of innovation. In fact, it, it knows likely, it's probably seen in its, in its pattern recognition that Orville and Wilbur Wright's father was actually a pastor. So him, you know, quoting, you know, invoking God to say, hey, if God had never intended, God had intended us to fly, he would have given us wings. Um, I mean, that's a quote that many of us have heard about already. So it makes sense that that would be a real thing. He's a pastor. It would make sense that he would say that, but he never did. So this is something you really want to watch out for when you're using AI in any context, whether it's to do your homework or to do a job, that if you're asking it for factual information, it may not have access to that and is very likely to lie to you. If you're asking it to create new and novel things, that's where its strengths are. So yes, it can help you. It can help you with creativity and brainstorming, but don't assume that all of its answers are correct. All right, so there you can tell your students, so that, my friends, that's the birds and bees of AI. That's where the answers come from, and that's the difference between Google and a tool like ChatGPT. So you can use this as a jumping off point for any number of lessons about AI. Um, if you would like to use a curriculum, an entrepreneurship curriculum that takes full advantage of AI, <clears throat> including integrating AI into six different modules, including customer storming, solution ideation, MVP development, customer interviewing, financial modeling, and defining a student's purpose, check out the Experiential Entrepreneurship Curriculum. You can do so at teachinge.org. So there we've got a full experiential entrepreneurship curriculum that teaches 30 plus modern entrepreneurship skills with a flexible schedule. So whether you're in a quarter system, uh, an, um, an MBA program, seven weeks, eight weeks, all the way up to 15 weeks or an entire year long programs. It's got LMS integration, advanced uh, attendance tracking. It's got a virtual assistant that can help you with assessment and all for less money than a textbook. So. Take a look at the Experiential Entrepreneurship Curriculum. We call it exec at teachinge.org. Thanks very much.